In this country, man walks with dignity and without fear. His profound love for freedom and the rights of all men is embedded in the foundation of his government, the Constitution of the United States. It guarantees certain fundamental rights and liberties to every human being under its jurisdiction. It is a flexible document designed to meet the needs and ever-changing conditions of American life. In this, your living Bill of Rights, you will hear the Supreme Court rulings on the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, and also its interpretation of guarantees of freedom contained in other parts of the Constitution. Ordinarily, Supreme Court decisions are final and without appeal, but if Americans do not agree with them, the decisions can be overruled through the process of constitutional amendment. Before anyone can properly understand the scope of our constitutional rights, he must realize that we Americans, by reason of our federal system, live under two governments rather than one. These two governments, federal and state, are closely bound together so that in some matters they function as one, but more frequently their operations are separate and distinct. Within the scope of activity which the people have entrusted to it, each government is master of its own affairs. In Article 1, there are two passages which refer to individual rights. The first is Section 9, Clause 2. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless, when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. When a person is confined or detained in a jail, penitentiary, or other institution, he may petition a federal court for a writ of habeas corpus. This is a legal procedure which demands that the person be brought before a court to test whether his personal freedom is being violated under the Constitution or laws of the United States. This device acts as a safeguard against unlawful imprisonment. In Clause 3 of the same section, further protection to individual liberty is added. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. When a legislature passes a bill which punishes persons without granting them a court trial, it is called a bill of attainder. In 1946, the Supreme Court had declared that Congress had passed a bill of attainder when it declared specific federal employees disloyal and provided that no federal funds should be used to pay their salaries then or at any time in the future. The court said that depriving a man of his job, branding him disloyal and making him a virtual outcast was deemed to be punishment. An ex post facto law is one which imposes punishment for an act which was not punishable at the time it was committed, or which increases punishment after the crime was committed. A vivid and tragic illustration of ex post facto law took place in Hungary during the uprisings of 1956. By Hungarian law, no one under 18 years of age could be sentenced to death. There were many youngsters below 18 who took part in the revolt. But since they could not be executed because of their youthful age, they were held in prison until they reached their 18th birthday and were then executed. Punishment for a crime was thus increased after the crime was committed. Congress is prohibited from passing either a bill of attainder or an ex post facto law. And by virtue of Section 10 of this same Article 1, State legislatures are also prohibited from taking either action. There are two parts in Article 3 which offer significant protections to the individual. First, Section 2, Clause 3. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trials shall be held in the state where the said crime shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. Except for impeachment, any person who is tried in federal court for a serious crime can have a jury. But the Supreme Court has ruled that this guarantee does not hold for trials for petty offenses and certain criminal contempts. It also excludes cases rightfully tried before court-martial or other military tribunal, and in some cases where the defendant has voluntarily relinquished his right to a jury. Section 3, Clause 1, relates to treason, the only crime defined by the Constitution. Listen carefully to the precise description of this offense. It suggests an awareness by our forefathers of the danger that unpopular views might be branded improperly as traitorous. 
recent experience in other countries with prosecutions for conduct loosely labeled treason confirms the wisdom of the authors of the Constitution in expressly stating what constitutes this crime and how it shall be proved. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. In the original Constitution, Article 6, Clause 3 completed the protections offered to individuals. It proclaims that both federal and state officers are required to swear or affirm that they will support the Constitution, but that a citizen need not fear that his religious convictions or lack of them may bar him from holding office in our country. The senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Each year in December, our nation honors a part of the Constitution known as the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, guarantees of individual liberty. To appreciate the interpretation placed upon some of the amendments by the Supreme Court, a knowledge of the facts of history is indispensable. In 1787, when the Constitution was first adopted, there was no Bill of Rights. The only protections for the individual against federal abuse then were those few guarantees just cited from the original articles of the Constitution. Many people argued that they did not place enough specific limitations on the power of the central government, that stronger guarantees should be incorporated into the Constitution, prohibiting the federal government from ever taking steps to suppress such rights as free speech and freedom of the press, or from ever establishing an official religion. As a result of these demands, the states were assured that if they would ratify the Constitution as it then stood, amendments would be forthcoming, guaranteeing additional rights to the individual. So the Constitution was ratified. And on December 15, 1791, the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, became part of the law of the land, the price of ratification. It must be emphasized, however, that the Bill of Rights did not protect the people against abuses by state governments. It protected them only against federal abuses. In 1833, Chief Justice John Marshall, in referring to the first ten amendments, made the point clear. These amendments demanded security against the apprehended encroachments of the general government, not against those of the local governments. These amendments contain no expression indicating an intention to apply them to the state governments. This court cannot so apply them. When the 14th Amendment, which is not part of the Bill of Rights, became law many decades later, it established important restrictions on the powers of the states and thereby gave added protections to the individual. By reason of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court has since ruled that some guarantees contained in the Bill of Rights, but not all of them, now do apply to the states as well as the federal government. The Bill of Rights. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Two express guarantees are given to the individual with respect to his religious freedom. First, Congress may not establish an official church or religion which all Americans must accept and support, or to whose tenets all must subscribe. Secondly, 
Each individual is guaranteed freedom to practice his religion in the manner he chooses, providing it does not conflict with valid government regulations to protect the public safety and welfare. For example, one may not have two wives and escape conviction for bigamy by attributing his conduct to his religious beliefs. Nor may a person commit an indecent act or engage in immoral conduct and then validly justify his actions on grounds of religious freedom. But for such exceptions, all religions must receive equal treatment by government, and there can be no discrimination by government, either in favor of or against any particular religion, however popular or unpopular it may be. The same restriction applies against state action through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The voice of the Supreme Court, through Mr. Justice Hugo Black, declared, Neither a state nor the federal government can constitutionally force a person to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. Neither can constitutionally pass laws or impose requirements which aid all religions as against non-believers. And neither can aid those religions based on a belief in the existence of God as against those religions founded on different beliefs. Though government may not give direct assistance to religion, the court has said that there is nothing in the Constitution which requires government to be hostile to it. Thus, it does not prevent the government from recognizing the importance of religion in the lives of the people, and so cooperating with religion that the people can more freely practice and exercise their religious beliefs. For example, the state may, if it wishes, permit public school students to attend religious instruction during school hours in their own churches or to stay away from school on religious holidays. It is also permissible for a state to provide free bus transportation to a religious school on the same basis as to all other schools, and it may exempt church property from taxation. But the state may not establish a program under which public classrooms are used for religious instruction. It may not compel students to attend religious classes. It may not underwrite the budget of religious schools or promote religion by making grants of public funds or property to those schools. It may not compel any form of religious observance. Thus, although it has been held by the Supreme Court that a state may designate Sunday as a day of rest, this must be for reasons not connected with religion. The guarantees of freedom of religion also protect thought and conscience. Resolving a conflict between patriotic loyalties and religious convictions, the Supreme Court has ruled that it is unconstitutional to exclude children from public schools because of their refusal on religious grounds to salute the American flag. Mr. Justice Robert Jackson pointed out that the First Amendment was designed to avoid attempts to compel uniformity of opinion. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. The next clause of Amendment 1, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The right to speak his mind is close to the heart of every American. The Constitution prohibits most forms of censorship over the press or speechmaker. The argument against censorship is clear. No government official should be permitted to dictate what ideas and beliefs we are entitled to hear or read. Mr. Justice Louis Brandeis believed that the dangers which might flow from unrestricted discussion of ideas, both good and evil, should be averted by more speech not enforced silence. Those who won our independence believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. That with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrines. That the greatest menace of freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. 
The United States Constitution, while guaranteeing freedom of speech and freedom of the press, does not grant a license for individuals to jeopardize the safety and well-being of society. The Supreme Court has ruled, for example, that this freedom does not extend to utterances which have no social or intellectual value, such as the obscene, the profane, and the libelous, nor to insulting language, which tends to cause an immediate breach of the peace. Thus, as Mr. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes pointed out, protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Similarly, while a person is free to make speeches on public streets, he may be prevented from doing so when he uses a loud and raucous amplifier which disturbs the public tranquility, or when the location chosen for his address is likely to interfere with the movement of traffic. The principle of freedom of speech and press gives one the right to criticize freely his form of government or his public officials, but it does not protect the individual when he knowingly engages in conspiracies to overthrow the government of the United States by force. The importance of free speech and a free press to the health of our society has led the courts to hold that these guarantees extend to state action by reason of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The right to assemble peaceably and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The Supreme Court has emphasized that freedom of assembly is just as fundamental as freedom of speech and press. Whether Americans are meeting for political activity, religious services, or for other purposes, they have the right to assemble peaceably and to organize themselves into associations for lawful purposes. When the Honorable Charles Evans Hughes was Chief Justice, he said, The right of peaceable assembly is a right cognate to those of free speech and free press, and is equally fundamental. For the right is one that cannot be denied without violating those fundamental principles of liberty and justice which lie at the base of all civil and political institutions, principles which the 14th Amendment embodies in the general terms of its due process clause. These rights may be abused to incite violence and crime, but the legislative intervention can find constitutional justification only by dealing with the abuse. The rights themselves must not be curtailed. Peaceable assembly for lawful discussion cannot be made a crime. Both the right of petition to enable a person to communicate with his government without obstruction and the right to assemble peaceably must also be honored by the states under the due process clause of Amendment 14. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In the days when the United States was a colony, the right to bear arms was very important. Nowadays, however, with well-trained military and police forces, the individual has less need for the personal use of weapons. The Supreme Court has held that the state and federal governments may pass laws prohibiting the carrying of concealed weapons, requiring the registration of firearms, and limiting the sale of firearms for other than military uses. Amendment 3. No soldiers shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Prior to the American Revolution, American colonists had frequently been required to provide lodging and food for British soldiers against their will. The Third Amendment prohibited the continuation of this practice. Though the Second and Third Amendments may seem to have little importance today, they established at least one important principle of American government, the principle of civilian ascendancy over the military, which has been a continuing influence in our domestic affairs to the present day. right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized.
In some countries, even today, police officers may search a person's home or office for evidence of wrongdoing, seize his property, and arrest him whenever they see fit. In the United States, on the other hand, the Fourth Amendment protects the individual and his property from unreasonable search and seizure by officers of the law. In most instances, the police officer must first go to a magistrate and convince him that there is probable cause, good reason, to believe that the individual involved has committed a crime or that he has in his possession the fruits of the crime or other evidence that he committed it. The magistrate, if convinced, then gives the police officer a court order called a warrant, permitting the police officer to search a precise place and seize the things described in the warrant. In searching for evidence, police are required to operate under strict legal procedures, as a ruling by Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter points out. The knock at the door, whether by day or night, as a prelude to a search without authority of law, but solely on the authority of the police, is inconsistent with the conception of human rights enshrined in the history and the basic constitutional documents of English-speaking peoples. Although the sanctity of one's privacy against illegal intrusion is one of the most important basic rights in our Constitution, experience has shown that such intrusions occasionally occur at the hands of overzealous police officers. Where this is the case, the court has ruled that neither federal nor state governments may use for prosecution such evidence obtained illegally. In words written by Mr. Justice Tom C. Clark, the court said, we hold that all evidence obtained by searches and seizures in violation of the Constitution is by that same authority inadmissible in a state court. Were it otherwise, then the assurance against unreasonable searches and seizures would be a form of words, valueless and undeserving of mention in a perpetual charter of inestimable human liberties. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Fifth Amendment prohibits trying a defendant in a federal court for an infamous, meaning serious, crime, unless he has first been accused by a grand jury, this charge generally being stated in a formal accusation called a bill of indictment. An indictment is not required for a trial by court-martial or in cases of contempt of court. Also, the Constitution does not require states to use grand jury indictments with respect to their criminal trials, but many states do use this procedure. Double Jeopardy. The Fifth Amendment also guarantees the individual that he will not be tried before a federal court more than once for the same crime. The Supreme Court has also stated that under the Due Process Clause safeguard of the 14th Amendment, State courts may not harass defendants by successive prosecutions for the same offense. Double jeopardy does not arise, however, when a single act violates both federal and state laws. In such cases, a person may be exposed to double prosecution in both federal and state courts. An example of such an offense would be bank robbery, both a state and federal offense. The Self-Incrimination Clause with certain exceptions, such as in instances where a witness is granted immunity against prosecution, a person need not answer questions in any federal proceeding which, in light of all the circumstances, tend to incriminate him. Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter, speaking for the Supreme Court in a 1956 decision, said, Too many, even those who should be better advised, view this privilege as a shelter for wrongdoers. They too readily assume that those who invoke it are either guilty of crime or commit perjury in claiming the privilege. Such a view does scant honor to the patriots who sponsored the Bill of Rights as a condition to acceptance of the Constitution by the ratifying states. 
No doubt the constitutional privilege may on occasion save a guilty man from his just deserts. It was aimed at a more far-reaching evil, a recurrence of the Inquisition and the Star Chamber, even if not in their stark brutality. The founders sought to close the doors against like future abuses by law enforcing agencies. The public does not always understand why an innocent person might invoke the privilege in response to any question. The protection provided by the Fifth Amendment may be lost by a witness who does not claim it promptly. Failure to do so may operate as a waiver of this constitutional protection. Although the Supreme Court has not ruled that a state must extend such protection, almost every state constitution contains some safeguard against self-incrimination. The Supreme Court has ruled, however, that under the Due Process Clause of Amendment 14, state and local police officials are forbidden to use coercion, the third degree, or any other unfair or brutal means to obtain involuntary confession from a person suspected of a crime. Due Process Clause. This clause is found both in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. In Amendment 5, it places a restraint upon the federal government, and in Amendment 14, the same restraint is placed upon the state governments. Just what due process means has never been fully defined. Its most literal meaning would probably be reasonable and proper procedure in meeting out justice. When public officials affront the dignity of man by use of conduct that shocks the conscience, due process is violated. Use of unfair methods in law enforcement or in legal proceedings such as a court admitting into evidence a confession obtained from a defendant by use of torture, or receiving evidence against a defendant by a prosecutor who knew such evidence was false, would plainly violate the due process protection extended by the Constitution. The clause also prevents state and federal governments from adopting arbitrary and unreasonable legislation, which interferes with important individual liberties, such as freedom to contract, to engage in lawful occupations, to marry, and to travel without unnecessary restraints. Just Compensation Clause. Government cannot take private property without paying for it. The Supreme Court has ruled, however, that where full value is paid to the owner, it is permissible to take private property for such public purposes as slum clearance and urban renewal, even though ultimately the property taken will be returned to private ownership, since the taking is really for the benefit of the community as a whole. Privately owned property which is drastically lowered in value because of governmental action may also be regarded as taken by government and therefore may require payment of compensation. Thus, the Supreme Court has held that the disturbance of the egg-laying habits of chickens on a man's poultry farm caused by the noise of low-level flights by military aircraft from a nearby air base lessens the value of that farm and that, accordingly, the landowner is entitled to receive compensation equal to his loss. By virtue of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, these rules also apply to the states. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. To be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment enumerates specific rights guaranteed to the individual who is prosecuted in federal court. It requires that the accused be brought to trial without unnecessary delay and guarantees that his trial will not be a secret one behind closed doors. The right of trial by jury was considered so important that it has been stated twice in our Constitution, in Article 3 and here in Amendment 6. In federal prosecutions, a jury of 12 and a unanimous verdict are required. But the Supreme Court has held that in state prosecutions, lack of a 12-man jury trial is not necessarily contrary to the standard of a fair trial, and therefore not contrary to the Due Process Clause of Amendment 14. However, the Constitution requires that when a jury is used, either in a state or federal trial, it must be impartial, 
and that persons cannot be excluded from jury service merely because of their racial, economic, religious, or other group affiliation. The remaining clauses of Amendment 6 relate to the fact that federal trials must not only be held in the state wherein the crime was committed, as required by Article 3, but also in the district wherein the crime was alleged to have taken place. Following this, Amendment 6 stipulates that the accused must be given notice in what respects it is claimed he has broken the law, in order that he may have an opportunity to prepare his defense. Generally, the accused is entitled to have all witnesses against him present their evidence orally in court, and, subject to certain exceptions, hearsay evidence cannot be used in federal criminal trials. Moreover, the accused is entitled to the aid of the court in having compulsory process issued, usually a subpoena, which will order into court those persons whose testimony he desires at the trial. Finally, the accused in any federal criminal case is entitled to a lawyer and must be provided with one by the court if he cannot afford the cost. A defendant may, however, waive the right of counsel, provided he fully understands what he is doing. Although the right of counsel granted by the Sixth Amendment applies only to federal trials, its principles are so important to a fair trial that they are often held applicable to the states as a rule of due process. Mr. Justice George Sutherland explained the reasons for the rule thus. The right to be heard would be in many cases of little avail if it did not comprehend the right to be heard by counsel. Without it, though the layman be not guilty, he faces the danger of conviction because he does not know how to establish his innocence. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. The Seventh Amendment applies only to federal civil trials and not to civil trials in state courts. Generally speaking, if a case is brought in federal court and the amount sought exceeds $20, the party bringing the suit and the defendant are entitled to have the controversy decided by the unanimous verdict of a 12-man jury. This right, however, may be relinquished voluntarily. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The purpose for setting bail is to assure the presence of the defendant at his trial. What is excessive bail, therefore, depends upon the facts in each particular case. In a few instances, as when a capital offense such as murder is charged, bail may be denied altogether. Whether fines or penalties are cruel or unusual must also be determined on the facts of each particular case. Torture is one form of punishment that would be deemed cruel. Cruelty under this provision must be tested not in the abstract, but by weighing both the end and the means used. The Supreme Court has, for example, declared that for a state to imprison a person whose only offense is that he is afflicted with a disease constitutes cruel and unusual punishment, contrary to the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Ninth Amendment emphasizes the view of the Founding Fathers that powers of government are limited by the rights of the people and that it was not intended by expressly guaranteeing in the Constitution certain rights of the people to recognize that government had unlimited power to invade other rights of the people. When the national government validly exercises powers delegated to it, laws so made are the supreme law of the land and are controlling over any state laws which are inconsistent. Amendment 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The Tenth Amendment reserves for the states the residue of powers not granted to the federal government or withheld from the states. Thus, the states and the people can enact laws relating to local affairs according to their own desires, except where they violate the federal constitution.
As a result of the war between the states, the next major step in the protection of individual liberty came in Amendment 13, Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. This amendment prohibited slavery and peonage in the United States. It has been held that certain state laws were in violation of this amendment, where they had the effect of jailing a debtor who did not perform his obligations. The Supreme Court has ruled, however, that selective service laws and laws requiring forced labor as punishment for crimes are not prohibited by this amendment. Amendment 14, Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. On July 23, 1868, the highly important Amendment 14 became part of our Constitution. It protects Americans from certain types of state action, thereby increasing their individual rights and freedoms. It provides for the rights of citizenship to both naturalized and natural-born persons, and proclaims that a child born in the United States is a citizen, even though his parents are aliens. The due process clause of this amendment has been referred to many times. It has never been fully defined, because its definition cannot be imprisoned within the treacherous limits of any formula. It was Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter who said, Due process, unlike some legal rules, is not a technical conception with a fixed content unrelated to time, place, and circumstances representing a profound attitude of fairness between man and man, and more particularly, between the individual and government. Due process is compounded of history, reason, the past course of decision, and stout confidence in the strength of the democratic faith which we profess. Elusive as its meaning may seem, the Due Process Clause has made the 14th Amendment one of the most important in our Constitution. It prohibits all state public officials and all private persons acting as agents of the state from acting capriciously or unreasonably in the exercise of their authority. It limits the power of the states and all subdivisions as to what they may do and how they may do it, and to a substantial degree protects persons against state action in the same way that we are protected against federal action by the Bill of Rights. The Equal Protection Clause of Amendment 14 prohibits a state from making arbitrary or unreasonable distinctions between different persons as to their rights and privileges. For example, the Supreme Court has held that a state cannot arbitrarily deny to some of its citizens the right to attend a public university or school open to others, to serve on juries, or to enjoy the advantages of public parks and beaches nor may it arbitrarily tax some citizens by a different standard than other citizens similarly situated. Nevertheless, the state remains free to make reasonable classifications. Amendment 15. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The right to vote which is the keystone of our democratic society, may not be denied to any citizen in either a state or federal election merely because he is born into a particular group. However, the Supreme Court has held that under certain circumstances, a state may grant voting rights to the literate, but deny them to the illiterate. Amendment 19. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Fifty years after Amendment 15 was ratified, in the year 1920, 
Amendment 19 gave women the right to vote. Today, in some democratic countries, women still do not possess this right. The purpose of Amendments 15 and 19, taken together with the 5th and 14th Amendments, is to prohibit any arbitrary attempt to disfranchise an American citizen, male or female, white, black or yellow, from his right to vote in federal or state elections. In addition to the rights of the individual under our Constitution, there are other safeguards in its very structure. For example, the separation of power between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of our government provides a system of checks and balances which tend to restrain each from gaining excessive concentration of power with the inevitable threat to individual liberties that accompanies such concentration. The existence of two houses of Congress, each chosen by a different process, is itself a protection against ill-advised laws that might threaten constitutional rights. Moreover, our federal system provides for a division of authority between national and state governments, giving the people the right to be heard in each. But with all of the protection our Constitution offers, it is the spirit of the people which makes them work. It is in the consent of the governed. As Mr. Justice Douglas has so aptly said, If we the people do not believe in the Bill of Rights, then the courts will not be able effectively to enforce it. They are able to do so only because the majority of people in the United States, however much they may disagree with a particular decision, agree with the basic principles of our written Constitution, including the power which we give our courts to interpret and enforce it.